chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about demon sitting. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Thomas O. is myself, voice talent Paul J. McSorley. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our featured tale this evening is brought to us by Velux Books and is written by Thomas O and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. They say that no one has the perfect job. In fact, you may be at your place of employment right now listening to this tale. Well, folks, after listening to this story, maybe your job may not seem so bad. Now, without further ado, I present to you Decamonoprogeny. The demon was trapped in the room and couldn't escape as long as someone was sitting in front of the doorway. The problem was, there had to be someone there all day, every day. And demon sitter isn't exactly the type of job you could advertise for on the internet. Could you even imagine what an ad like that would look like? Help wanted. Join our dynamic team of pious, stodgy lay people who've maintained a decades-long vigil over a powerful evil being who enjoys destroying souls. Must be good at resisting psychological games, spiritual attacks, and invasive mind probing. Pay is nearly non-existent, but a monthly stipend will be provided to those who last that long. Please inquire within for this exciting opportunity to help keep this captured demon off the streets. So I'm sure you can understand that finding someone to fill a position like that wouldn't be easy. And yet for a long time, decades actually, three dedicated people worked in 12-hour shifts keeping a never-ending watch upon the captured hellspawn. Over the years, other watchers stepped in and tried to help out, but none of them lasted long. It was the same core three who kept coming back, but they were getting old, their minds were becoming faulty, and their bodies were getting achy. The cracks were showing, and a new generation of dedicated watchers, ones who could withstand the demon's attacks, was needed. So why did the congregation choose me to help them? because I was a lifelong member of the church who was willing, faithful, and available. I had spent many of my formative years as part of the church's youth group and had forged some meaningful friendships. I owed so much to the congregation. I'll admit I had tried to talk my way out of it after I had already accepted the job and then came to understand what it entailed. 
I didn't realize this is a real-life demon, I argued. I mean, growing up I heard the rumors like everyone else, but I'm not qualified for this kind of thing. Nobody is qualified for this, came Pastor Johansson's terse reply. I couldn't argue with that logic. I was given several days of instruction before I was to start, but for the most part, what they taught me all boils down to the following points. Do not touch the demon. Do not leave the room until relieved. There can be only one person in the room at a time with the demon, otherwise one of them will be manipulated into injuring or killing the other. I guess they found this out the hard way. The demon is stuck in a corporeal state, but its physical appearance will be different every time you see it. The demon can't physically hurt you while you are in the room. Your best bet is to just ignore it if you can. Again, do not touch the demon. On my first night, I arrived at the church and then forced my quivering legs to carry me toward the dark staircase that would take me down to the musty basement. A heavy wooden door greeted me when I got to the bottom. I took a deep breath and knocked three times. The door creaked open and I was greeted by an elderly, tired-looking gentleman named Eldon, whom I had met a few times during my training. He gave me a smile when he saw me. Good evening, Bennett, he said. He glanced at my shaky hands and added, You're going to do fine. I nodded and put one foot inside the room as I had been instructed. He then stepped one foot outside of the room so that we were both half in and half out. Ready? He asked. I nodded, and then we both picked up our remaining feet so that as he completely left the room, I entered it. The solid door creaked closed behind me. The only lighting was from a single flickery overhead fluorescent tube, but it wasn't enough for me to see just how dingy and dusty my surroundings were. The walls and ceiling had large dark splatters on them. Blood? I wasn't sure. The room smelled damp and dirty. I don't know why I was surprised by the state of the room. It's not like you could just bring a cleaning crew in to spruce everything up. There was a single chair for me to sit in, right next to the door. The demon was huddled in the corner. It was the size of a child, but its face was wrinkled and withered. Its gray hair grew greasy and long. After a few uneasy moments, the thing spoke to me. Will you help me? It said in a surprisingly sweet voice. I'd been told to expect such things and knew better than to answer. I'm in a lot of pain. I sat down on the chair and looked at my watch. Eleven hours and fifty-nine minutes to go. I'd like to go to a hospital. The demon held up an arm that had an unnatural bend in it, as if it had a broken bone. See? Eleven hours and fifty-eight minutes to go. I shifted my gaze away. The demon slowly stepped closer to me and smiled. You would ignore a little old person in need? It asked incredulously. Then it laughed as it dropped all pretense. Its voice suddenly took a commanding tone. You are Bennett Melton, twenty-six years old. You're an only child and you live with your mother. She thinks you're working here as a janitor because you didn't think she'd believe the truth. Graduated college two years ago with a degree in sociology, but you still haven't found a job yet. You've been drunk only once in your life. Virgin, not by choice, although you pretend that it is. You always wear long sleeve shirts because you don't want people to see your arms. The demon gave a knowing wink. I instinctively tugged on my sleeves. My life story sounded sad when distilled down to such basic elements. No matter, I remained stoic. You're a loser, Bennett. You've got no future. 
At least not one that you look back on in your old age and be proud of. You should leave here with me, and together we'll go out and paint the town red. I remain silent. Talk to me, Bennett. Things will be so much more interesting if you talk. The demon continued to stare at me, leaning in so that it was only inches from my face. I could feel the short puffs of its breath drumming against my cheek. I can do this forever, it said. I managed to ignore the unmoving creature for hours and even became accustomed to the smell of its breath, which oddly smelled of roses. But I had my limits and eventually I broke down and spoke. Stop it, I demanded. The demon backed up as a cackle erupted from its throat. <laughs> you broke way too fast. I was right about you. You're a loser. You know nothing about me. You're nothing more than a liar. I shot back, knowing full well that simply by speaking, I'd been bested. Oh, make no mistake. I'm unrivaled among all liars. But the very best liars tell the truth nearly all of the time. And you know full well that nothing I've said tonight is a lie. I turned away again, this time with renewed strength, determined not to speak. The withered demon giggled and walked back to the corner of the room where it sat down on the floor. For the rest of that night, nothing more was said, but that damn thing never took its eyes off me. I returned the next night feeling as if I'd rather be anywhere else. I checked in with Pastor Johansson before I started my shift. Last night was incredibly difficult, even harder than I was expecting, I said. He nodded his head in understanding. This is the most important thing you'll ever do. It'll get easier with time, I promise. But how long does that take? I asked. The pastor looked almost annoyed. I don't know. It just takes time. During my training, Eldon mentioned that you used to cover shifts for them, but not anymore. Why is that? There are very good reasons. I won't go into them now. But you still expect others to go? Yes. The pastor's answers left me wholly unsatisfied. Nonetheless, I persisted. Why is that thing even here? Shouldn't you have important people dealing with something of this magnitude? We're a lone congregation. We're the ones who trapped the demon, and the obligation to guard it falls upon us, and only us. I strode crossly toward the basement and descended the staircase. I'm not sure what I had been expecting to get out of my conversation with the pastor, but whatever it was, I hadn't gotten it. I put my reservations aside and knocked three times on the door. Eldon let me in with a pleasant greeting and I switched places with him. I was immediately greeted by a horrible sight. This time, instead of a small wrinkled being, a monstrous form stood in front of me in full demon regalia, warts all over its skin, horns coming from its head, misshapen joints, jagged teeth. The thing must have stood seven feet tall. It was almost as if the demon was going intentionally overboard in its attempt to unsettle me, and it worked. I thought back to what I was told in training to help calm myself. The demon cannot physically harm you while you're in the room. I sat on the chair and looked to the ground. The demon resumed his staring game from the night before, but this time I could feel it penetrating my thoughts. You brought a book with you tonight. Are you going to read me some stories? It asked with a baritone voice. I brought a small Bible with me, stuffed into my pants pocket. It had belonged to my father. 
Did you really think that would help you? The demon asked. It moved closer, with its face only inches from mine. Its breath smelled of rotten fish. The Bible is one of my favorite books. Will you read it to me? My hands clenched together until my knuckles were white. The demon chuckled. <laughs> you brought that book because you believe it will give you protection. And now that I ask you to read it to me, you remain silent? You must not have much faith after all. I reached into my pocket, pulled the Bible out, and opened it to the New Testament. No, the Old Testament is far more interesting. Read 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 23, the demon said. I ignored the request and started reading the verse I wanted. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Read me what I ask for, the demon interrupted. Or are you afraid that there are certain parts of the Bible that won't hold up? I paused, then flipped to the Old Testament and read the requested passage. Elisha left Jericho to go to Bethel, and on the way, some boys came out of a town and made fun of him. Get out of here, Baldy, they shouted. Elisha turned around, glared at them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and tore forty-two of the boys to pieces. My voice trailed off. The demon roared in laughter to the point where it actually fell down and rolled on the ground. <laughs> See? <laughs> it said between fits of laughter. Once you get past all the dry parts, that book is hilarious. You can't take that literally, I said. You have to understand the implications. They weren't just a group of simple children. They were a gang of evil young men who found themselves judged by God for threatening his prophet. The demon wiped a tear from his eye. Implications? It seems pretty specific to me. Apologists like you have been strewn all through history. You think the Bible is literal up until the moment it's inconvenient then you have to come up with the excuses for it. Why don't you go ahead and read a little more? Entertain me. We have all night. I put my Bible back in my pocket and crossed my arms over my chest. I don't need to defend anything to you. No matter, said the demon. I know all religious texts word for word. The Bible, the Veda, the Talmud, all of them. But for your sake, we'll stick to the Bible. He then began speaking in a language I didn't understand, but stopped abruptly after a few moments. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to hear that in English? The passages lose a lot of their impact when they're not in their original language. But I suppose there's no point if you don't understand it. He made a show of clearing his throat, then continued. <coughs> Everyone in Babylon will run about like a hunted gazelle, like sheep without a shepherd. They will try to find their own people and flee to their own land. Anyone who is captured will be cut down, run through with a sword. Their little children will be dashed to death before their eyes. Their homes will be sacked, and their wives will be raped. He stopped and looked directly at me. Now, isn't that just hilarious? Do you see why it's among my favorites? 
You're only cherry-picking the passages that you think prove your point. Well, you must admit, I've been given a lot of cherries to pick from. How about this ripe little one right here? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. The demon tapped his toes on the ground, seemingly giving me time to absorb what he said. So, is that why you're here? He asked. Because you're the pastor's good little slave, subjecting yourself to my presence, while he refuses to come and see me again? I'm done responding to you. I don't want any more responses from you tonight, the demon replied. Just listen to me as I recite more of your precious Bible to you. I swallowed hard and stared straight ahead. On my third night, I checked in at the rectory again. You made it back, Pastor Johansson said, pleased. I'll be honest, you've made it further than many of the others who tried. I almost didn't come in, but I wanted to prove I could do it. It's okay to prove it to yourself, but you don't need to prove anything to that creature. I hope that's not what you're feeling. I glanced at my watch. It's almost time for me to start. I did the changeover with Eldon. He was far more tired looking than the two previous nights. I greeted him kindly and took my seat as the door closed. The demon was in the corner of the room, sprawled motionless on the floor. I noticed almost immediately that it was wearing the same clothing Eldon had been wearing when he left. I stepped closer so I could get a good look at its face. Its eyes were closed, but even then, I could see that it had taken the form of Eldon. A chill descended upon me as the thought that maybe this really was Eldon on the ground before me and the demon was the one who just left the room. If that was the case, the pastor would have to be notified immediately. Eldon, I said, is that you? It appeared that he was barely breathing. I reached my hand toward his shoulder, but I stopped just an inch or so away. I'd been specifically instructed never to physically touch the demon. Doing so would grant it the power to touch me in return. But this was Eldon, and he needed help, right? I blew some air in his cheek. Eldon, wake up, I shouted. There was no response. I reached in one more time despite the voice in the back of my mind that was screaming at me to stop. I yanked my hand back when it was only a hair's width away from him. Instead, I stood up and slowly retreated back to my chair. A few minutes later, it seemed that Eldon had stopped breathing altogether. Eldon, if that's really you, please forgive me. Five hours. That's how long I sat in the room with a motionless Eldon. I can't tell you how many times I almost got up to try and check on him. But if that wasn't Eldon, then there was too much at stake for me to try anything at all. Then the body lying on the ground spoke. If you'd been paying more attention during your training, this little trick wouldn't have stressed you out so much. I let out a sigh. The demon was still in the room with me. It sat up with a laugh. I was beginning to hate hearing that thing laugh. Do you like my Elden impression? I simply folded my arms across my chest and looked at the wall. That's okay. You don't need to speak to me tonight. I've put you through enough already, it said. For now, just listen. Because I have a story to tell you. You like stories, right? I continued to stare at the wall. The demon sat up and cleared its throat. <clears throat> One day, about 50 years ago, there were three young men who lived in this very same town we're in now. They each loved the same young woman, and each of them was determined to be the one to marry her. 
They abandoned everything in their lives that mattered to them in order to woo her. Their jobs, their friends. One of them had just gotten married and had a small child at home, but that didn't make a difference. He left them. The demon glanced over to see if I was listening, and despite my attempts to appear uninterested, the look I had on my face seemed to please it. It continued the story with delight. The girl? She was beautiful. And I don't mean that she was simply pretty. No, she was the most gorgeous thing ever created by nature. Her beauty was beyond anything that could be described by mere words. But you could say it was the kind of beauty that emperors would go to war over. And yet... Here she was in this small, insignificant speck of a town. My arms remained crossed, but admittedly, I was listening. The demon kept speaking. Now, the three young men, they weren't willing to share her. Each one wanted her for themselves and themselves only. This led to many arguments and fights. So they decided that they would meet up in the woods, away from the hustle and bustle of the town, and have a serious discussion about which one of them was most deserving of the girl. This was an awful plan, because each of them had secretly brought a knife along, and it wasn't long before they began attacking one another. In the end, they all bled to death from their horrible wounds, while the girl watched from behind a tree and laughed. In fact, the girl had visited each of them separately the night before, and she was the one who had given them the knives as gifts. Why are you telling me this story? I asked. Because it's hilarious! They stabbed and stabbed and stabbed one another. You don't see the humor in that? I shook my head. Well, to be honest, the story actually does have a tragic part to it, because one of the young men who died was a decamonoprogeny, which is a protected person the girl should not have involved in a deadly scheme. She failed to realize his true nature beforehand. It was one of the very few mistakes she had made in all her existence. She became vulnerable and exposed, temporarily stripped of any power she might have had. In the end, certain people in the town began to understand what her true nature was, and she wound up getting captured and held hostage in a small room by a bunch of country bumpkins. Tragic, no? I looked at the demon, still in the form of Eldon. It actually had a sad look on its face. Of course, the demon continued. You're wondering what exactly a decamonoprogeny is. It's not a term someone like you would have heard. The demon stood up and started pacing. It's an only child of an only child of an only child and so on. It has to go back at least ten generations. They're rarer than you might think, almost impossibly rare, and like any rare creature, they're prized, and their lives are given certain protections. They're also incredibly difficult to detect. The demon stood up and stared straight at me. Yes, difficult, but not impossible. The vast majority of them don't even know what they are. I don't care, I asserted. The Elden Demon, paying no attention to what I had just said, instantly perked up. But the story has a happy ending because a few years later, as her power slowly returned, the girl was able to leave the room after she learned how to be in two places at once. The funny part is that the country bumpkins didn't even realize it. The demon gave a hearty chuckle. <laughs> In fact, the girl even went to visit your house earlier tonight. 
She talked to your mother and admired all the red roses that you have in front of the house. Oh, the yellow pansies are lovely as well. Your mother seemed quite proud of the way they visually pop out against the blue paint of the house. My jaw dropped. The demon had just described my home. Mom, did anyone come by here last night? My mom put a plate of eggs and toast down in front of me. It's kind of strange that you should ask, but yes. Remember that one pretty girl that you were in youth group with a few years ago? Susan, I think. After you left, she stopped by here. My fork dropped from my hand. Susan? I haven't seen her in a few years. What was she doing here? I'm not too sure. It was right before sunset, and I saw her outside admiring my flowers, so I went out to say hello. She told me she was out for a jog, just getting some exercise, apparently. Did she tell you anything else? Not much, really. She was sweet as always, I guess. Very complimentary of my roses. I pushed my plate aside and stood up from the table. Thanks, Mom, but I'm not hungry. I think I'm just going to try and get some sleep. I checked in with Pastor Johansson that night. It told me that it escaped, that it can be in two places at once, I said. It's said that before. It's lying. It always lies. But it said it had been to my house, and when I asked my mom if anyone had come by, she said that an old friend of mine, someone I haven't seen in years, had dropped by out of the blue. It will use trickery on you. It can probe your mind and even probe the minds of those who are closest to you. It simply used a coincidental happening to its advantage. I just don't know how much longer I can do this. You have to keep your faith. We need you. You're doing the Lord's work. As long as you ignore it, nothing bad can happen. I walked down to the basement and did the switch over this time with a gray-haired woman named Sheila. She nodded kindly at me as we switched places in the doorway. It's nice to see a new face around here. Thank you, I said as I stepped inside. The door closed with a thud as I turned and looked at the demon. I paused for a moment when I saw that it had taken the form of my father, who had died several years earlier. I'm so happy you came back, he said. I sat down in my chair. He stepped up close to me, almost getting into my face. So, tell me, what did you do after your mother told you that Susan stopped by? Did you go up to your bedroom and think about her? Did you tell your mom about how you were secretly in love with Susan, but never had the courage to tell her? Did you jerk off to your fond memories of her? I folded my arms and stared straight ahead. And when you were done jerking off, did you have to punish yourself by cutting another mark into your arm? My right hand instinctively reached over to my left arm, where the scars of hundreds of cuts were hidden by my long sleeve. The demon continued. Exactly how many cuts do you have in that arm of yours? Four? Five hundred? I highly advise you to stop cutting yourself every time you jerk off. Enjoyment should not equal suffering, son. I'm not your son. And of course, I'm not really your father. But seeing he was the one who put the crazy idea in your head that self-pleasure is a punishable offense, then maybe it would be best that he be the one to tell you that it's actually not. Perhaps many of the beliefs you cling to should be discarded, don't you think? I could feel my left arm tingling, as if all the cuts I had made over the years were tiny worms squirming around under my skin. I scratched my arm reflexively. Bennett, do you remember that time when your youth group volunteered at the community center? And when you were done, all of you went swimming at the community pool? Susan was there too, right? Yes, I remembered, but I shook my head no. Remember what she wore to go swimming? 
It was a little more revealing than you expected, wasn't it? How many cuts did you have to make on your arm from that one? My arm continued to tingle, but I stood in stone-faced silence while the demon went on and on, reminding me of all the times I had lusted after Susan, who had love from the first moment I met. I endured the verbal fusillade that entire night until Sheila came back to relieve me in the morning. Mom, do you think Dad was ever wrong about anything? My mom slipped a plate of pancakes in front of me. She seemed a little surprised by the question. What brings this on? She asked. I don't know. I was just thinking about him, I guess. Well, your father was human, like the rest of us. She paused to think through her next words carefully. We didn't always agree on how to raise you, if that's what you're wondering. He was hard on you. Maybe a little too hard at times. So that means you think he was wrong about certain things? He always did what he thought was best. He never knew his own dad, and I think that always drove him to overcompensate a little bit with you. I bit into my pancakes while I thought about everything that had transpired. I went in for my fifth night in a row. Afterward, I would have a few nights off, which I was looking forward to. I did the switchover once again with Sheila. I sat down in the chair and saw to my dismay that the demon had taken the form of Susan, the girl, and now woman, whom I had lusted over for so many years. Hey, Bennett, she said casually. How are you doing? It's been a while, hasn't it? It had been five years, three months, and ten days since I'd seen Susan, but I didn't take the bait. I missed you, she continued. Remember all the fun times we had? She stepped closer to me. She was as beautiful as I remembered, perhaps even more so. Even the miserable fluorescent lighting couldn't dim the features of her exquisite face. But of course, this wasn't really Susan, right? Yeah, I know what you're thinking, that I'm not really Susan. But the truth is that it's been me the whole time. You're not Susan, I said defiantly. Well, I go by many names, but Susan is indeed one of them. She saw that I still wasn't fully convinced. Just think back to when we all used to hang out together. Where did I live? Did you ever see my parents? Doesn't it seem strange that I was just always there without having come from anywhere? I remembered back to the time when Susan and I had been friends, and though it had never occurred to me at the time, Susan's existence did seem a bit mysterious upon examination. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that one day she had basically popped out of nowhere. No family that I remember, no real origin. Just sort of there. But well, why would you hang out with a bunch of church kids? I asked. Because it was fun. She said, Do you remember poor old Harold? Harold Rayner. He had jumped off a bridge and killed himself. She waited a moment for the name to sink in, then spoke again. He wanted to fuck me, just like all the boys did. And when he couldn't, he decided he'd rather die. Oh, and do you remember Kevin? Kevin Brighton. He'd been hit by a locomotive. At the time, Nobody was really sure if it was an accident or suicide, but it was now becoming plainly obvious that it was the latter. Susan laughed as the memories of the dead boys flashed through my mind. The truth is, I do my best work in the church, she said. There are just so many desperate and conflicted souls. In fact, there are only three people who I know of in this congregation who are truly virtuous. Do you want to guess who they are? I knew, but I didn't say it out loud. They were the only three people who were able to maintain a vigil over the demon for any real length of time. That's right. It's those three, she said, apparently reading my mind. And they've wasted their pious little lives under the mistaken belief that they were making any sort of difference at all. 
Even the pastor didn't last long in here. Do you know he actually showed me his dick? I laughed at how small it was and then he cried. He wanted to fuck me, but I wouldn't give him the chance. Just a simple touch from him would have unbound me from this room entirely. But I still rejected him because he's pathetic. He doesn't come in here anymore. She moved in close to my face, just a few inches away. I could smell a sweet perfume on her. But your dick isn't small. You've got a big gun in those pants, don't you? Her sudden change in tone took me by surprise. But the surprise was pleasant. She was wearing a loose top, and as she leaned closer, I was able to look down and see her bare breasts. I thought about turning away from the sight before me, but it was too marvelous and mesmerizing. I felt a stirring in my pants, which I tried to cover with my hand. She shooed my hand away from my pants, nearly touching me, but still managing to avoid any real physical contact. It's okay, she cooed. Just let it happen. I shook my head and finally managed to look away. No, it's not right. Yesterday you appeared as my father. Before that you were Eldon. You were a monster and a tiny little creature too. Those were just facades. I had to disarm you. I had to break you down so that I could rebuild you. She removed her shirt and her pants and stood before me completely naked. Look at me. This is the true me. The form in which I was created. I am beauty. I am light. She leaned in so that I could smell the nape of her neck. I inhaled her scent deeply and felt myself growing bigger. Go ahead and feel my breasts, she said. I know you want to. It's okay. No, it wasn't okay. Yet nonetheless, a deluge of memories spun through my mind making me relive all the times that Susan had smiled at me or innocently brushed up against me or casually leaned in to share a secret. There were so many times that I just wanted to hold her. But always, alongside those thoughts, was the voice of my dad berating me and telling me that my feelings were the embodiment of sin. I didn't want to listen to my dad any longer. I forced him from my mind. Go to hell, Dad. You've given me only emptiness. For once, I choose pleasure. His voice left me, and the squirming sensation of the scars on my arms ceased forever. He was truly dead, but Susan was right in front of me, alive and gorgeous. It was an intoxicating moment that ensnared my mind. As if I was on autopilot, I reached out for her breast and felt its perfection fill my hand. A pleasant warmth shot through my arm as I made contact. That feels nice, Bennett. You have such a gentle touch. She put her arm around me and sat down on my lap. Keep going. There's no reason for you to stop now. She leaned in and kissed me deeply as my hands began roaming over her entire body. I was spent. Susan and I were lying on the floor after hours of carnal pleasure. She had let me do anything to her that I wanted, and I had taken full advantage of the situation. Susan traced her finger along my chest. Wasn't that wonderful? She asked. I nodded in agreement, but as I did so, my head began to clear from the enchanted fog that had taken hold of my mind. Are you really Susan? I asked her. You have to figure that out for yourself, lover. But just know that in the five nights you've been here, I only told you one teeny tiny lie. But it was the exact lie you needed to hear. What was the lie? I asked. She kissed my nose. I'll never tell, she said with a devilish smile. And that's the truth. I thought back to what she had said on the first night about the best liars telling the truth most of the time. Seems she was right about that. She kept cooing in my ear. And now, sweetheart, I need you to go home and castrate yourself. What? You heard me, my love. There's really no other way for this to end. 
go home and cut your balls off. Then wait for me. I'll come retrieve you when I'm ready. My hands shot downward as I reflexively covered myself, yet at the same time there was a strange, nagging little part of me that just wanted to make her happy. Or maybe I knew that my actions deserved punishment. Still, I protested. I don't know if I can. Sure you can, sweetie. You're my prize and you'll do as I say. I have plans for you. So listen up. There's a nice, sharp knife in your nightstand. You know, the one that you use to punish yourself. She ran a finger along the cuts of my arm. It'll be the quickest way. It will hurt, I protested, desperately trying to think of a way to avoid the inevitable. Love hurts, baby, she whispered with her hot, sinful breath in my ear. I don't love you. Don't lie to me, she said. You've always loved me. There was no room left for debate, and even though there was still a part of me that was screaming no, I got up from the floor and walked to the door. I didn't even bother to put my clothes back on. I turned and took one last look at Susan. Beautiful, gorgeous, naked Susan. And then opened the door and walked up the steps. I left the building and stepped out into the pre-dawn air without a second thought. I walked home at a brisk, determined pace arriving while it was still dark. The knife was in my nightstand drawer, exactly where Susan knew it would be. As I picked it up, I could hear the sound of far-off emergency sirens. A momentary curiosity diverted me from my task. I stepped up to the window and brushed aside my curtains to see what was going on. On the horizon, there was an orange glow emanating from the church's steeple. Fire. I shrugged and let the curtains fall back into place. Back to the task at hand. Any last resistance I might have harbored had slowly dissipated. In fact, I'd come to a place of complete understanding. She needed me, but she couldn't have me trying to fuck her all day long. Nothing would be accomplished like that. It all made sense. I would be far more useful to her this way. I lowered the knife down to my groin with a smile on my face, knowing that it wouldn't be too much longer before Susan came to retrieve me. I hope you enjoyed Decamono Progeny, as written by Thomas O. and performed by Paul J. McSorley. You can find more of Thomas O's work, along with many others, over at veloxbooks.com. That's V-E-L-O-X-B-O-O-K-S dot com. As for me, you can find more of me right here on our very own network, as well as over on Audible, or just check out paulsbooks.net. And be sure to check out Fear from the Heartland, which has over 120 episodes for you to love and enjoy. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. Oh, and follow us on Facebook Twitter, and Instagram, if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>